Hi everybody and welcome back. In today's video we're going to talk about interpretation of the doctor's data stool test. This is a blast from the freaking past for me because this was a stool test that I used briefly when I first started my clinical career. It's not nearly as popular these days thanks to the GI map and some other testing coming out but it is still ordered a fair whack of the time by functional medicine practitioners, integrative medicine, naturopathic medicine, you know, all of the hippy dippy health professions. Uh, they do order this a moderate amount of the time. So I wanted to cover this stool test in some detail. Let's get into it and we will talk about the doctor's data. I have chosen the comprehensive stool analysis with parasitology times three. And what I do appreciate about this test is that they give this nice rainbow look to it where they have the green guys are obviously good. The, you know, it depends, medium, maybe bad opportunists over here, and then the blatantly dysbiotic flora are over here in the red or the pink section. So that's very, pardon me, that's very nice. Um, what I will say is that I would not place a lot of weight in this stool test. And here's the deal. So doctor's data is a culture-based stool test. So you can see here, culture, yeast is culture. So what they're doing is they're taking some of that stool sample and they're smearing it on a Petri dish, basically, and they're waiting to see what grows. And the problem with that is that the vast majority of the human microbiota are anaerobic, meaning that they don't tolerate oxygen. So what happens when you poop something out and then ship that poo to the lab, A, that may have changed in composition between your house and the lab, but B, the bigger problem is that once you spread that poo out on a Petri dish and then you wait to see what grows, you are now very strongly favoring the bacteria that are tolerant to oxygen or who like oxygen, the aerobes, and you are inhibiting or killing anything that is oxygen sensitive or anaerobic. So for example, E. coli is a normal part of the human microbiome. It's, it was, I think, the first thing that was isolated from the human microbiota, and it does perfectly fine in oxygen. But that's also why we have some of the funky patho pathogenic strains of E. coli that can overgrow. So, you know, E. coli 0157, or one of the other bad E. coli. So this is why we have the bad E. coli, because if there is contamination in water or food, that E. coli does not get killed off by the presence of oxygen versus something like bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. They are anaerobic, so they typically don't grow fantastically on a culture. And very, very frequently, like when I ordered this test back in the day, I would see people come back with very low levels or undetectable levels of lactobacillus and bifido species. And what I finally realized, and part of why I moved away from using this test, is that that's not necessarily reflective of what's actually in their gut. It's reflective of the way that they're doing the test. By culturing something that doesn't like oxygen in an oxygen-rich environment and then expecting it to grow, you're going to automatically handicap these poor bacteria. Now, that being said, lactobacillus is said to be an oxygen tolerant or an aerotolerant anaerobe. So it can tolerate oxygen. It's just not going to flourish with it around. And similarly, there is a little bit of nuance with the bifido because some bifido species do okay in oxygen, like they're not gonna all right away die, and then some of them are not oxygen tolerant. So it really depends on the strain and the species, which they don't give you that information, they just say species. But for what it's worth, from my observations using this test years ago, lactobacilli and bifido don't seem to do well in this test and almost always people will have low levels. I would much rather do a test where you're using a snapshot in time and right after you collect the stool sample you put it in a medium or a liquid that preserves and kills the bacteria but preserves their DNA and then using a DNA based test like shotgun sequencing, whole genome metagenomics, uh, even PCR or 16S, one of those DNA based technologies is going to be much more useful rather than seeing what you can grow. So that being said, um, the beneficial flora, I very frequently will see everything except for E. coli come back low, and that is why that happens. Um, the, you know, the, the commensal and the dysbiotic 
most frequently what you're going to observe is that these are aero-tolerant or aerobic bacteria, which again is not going to be reflective of what is in your gut. Your gut tube is devoid of oxygen. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that short chain fatty acids do for you like butyrate is they maintain that oxygen gradient to keep your colon healthy. So not only is your colon and your small intestine going to be devoid of, of I'm sorry, devoid of oxygen, but now you're taking that colony of bacteria, putting it in open air on a Petri dish and then hoping for something to grow. You're only gonna favor the aerobic bacteria this poor person might not have an overgrowth of Klebsiella. It's just that Klebsiella happens to grow really well on that culture medium in an oxygen rich environment. So I, I really think that this is a pretty useless part of the test here. Uh, similarly, yeast culture, uh, I don't know. Like I, I think that that is also limited utility because it is a culture based technology. Um, the microscopic yeast, this is where they're looking under a microscope and they're looking to see if there's visible yeast. Um, you would have to have quite a lot of yeast for that to be the case. I think if it comes back positive, you could take that to the bank and you can run with it and say that you have candida overgrowth. If it comes back negative, it doesn't get you off the hook. Um, but I do think that that might be missing a lot of people. And then I will point out here that they do mention that Aramonas, Campylobacter, and company have been specifically tested for and found absent unless otherwise reported. So that's at least good that they give you that information. But you'll notice that the list is relatively short. There's, what have we got? Seven, eight. There are eight bacteria that they're specifically testing for. And the rest, they're just seeing what grows on a culture medium. Eh. Pretty humdrum if you ask me. The parasitology, I do think is a bit more useful in part because they do the three day sampling. Uh, that is one of the tricky things with parasites is that sometimes they can hide out. So you do wanna do a multi-day collection for parasites if you can, or if you're highly, highly suspicious of it. And they are looking for eggs, they're looking for tapeworms, they're looking for protozoas. Um, it is a, a pretty decent way of doing this type of testing. So I think that the parasitology portion of this test you can largely take to the bank. And then last, they've got a couple of other markers. They've got yeast. Again, if there's visible amounts of yeast, you're, you're pretty yeasty. So this is probably gonna miss some people, but overall it's okay. Red blood cells and white blood cells in a stool sample would be pretty atypical. Um, I think that they probably are perfectly capable of seeing that under a microscope when they're doing the three-day collection. Uh, pollen is really interesting. They, they must have added that since I last ran this test. Um, and the crystals, I don't even know what that is. I would have to look it up. Um, and then the immunoassays, they are specifically testing for Giardia and Cryptosporidium, and those are both coming back negative for this person. So that's wonderful. And then finally, I will, add, I will uh, end on a high note for the, the doctor's data stool test. And these are the things that I think it does a reasonably good job on to the point where you can order just this part of the stool test. And I have done that before in conjunction with a 16S test or a LabCorp test or some other tests. Sometimes I will order this portion alone and not include the culture and the parasitology and the other stuff because I, I don't think they're as useful. Um, but here we have pancreatic elastase that is reflective of your pancreatic output low levels of that would be indicative of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and a need for digestive enzymes. If you have fat or muscle fibers or vegetable fibers or carbohydrate detected in your stool, that means you are malabsorbing or maldigesting one of those things. So if you have fat showing up in your stool sample, that means you are maldigesting or malabsorbing fat and you have a need for some enzymatic support, support there. The Inflammatory markers, I think doctor's data does a relatively good job on, you know, lactoferrin, calprotectin, lysozyme. They are, um, you know, I'm glad that they include multiple because as an example, the GI map only includes calprotectin. They don't include lactoferrin and lysozyme. So I'm glad that doctor's data has all three. I think that is a bit more useful than the GI map. Uh, mucus, white blood cells, I think those are pretty self-explanatory. And then secretory IgA, uh, 
I think that they do an okay job at this as far as I can assess. Um, but secretory IgA is your mucosal defense. What very frequently I will see is that people will have pretty profound dysbiosis or an infection and their secretory IgA is low. And those are the cases where I'm really trying to boost secretory IgA and get that, that response logged online to do some of the heavy lifting for us. If you have dysbiosis or an infection and you have elevated secretory IgA, I think that is entirely appropriate. Your body is just trying to help you fight some of those, those pathogens or some of those bacteria. And it doesn't mean that you need to lower it. It means that you just need to help your body achieve its goal and get rid of the infection or the dysbiosis. So secretory IgA, I think they do an okay job at that. I mentioned this in my GI effects video, but the utility of measuring short chain fatty acids in the stool, I think is iffy. Um, this could be entirely reflective of your output or your production, right? So your microbiome has made these things for you and that is what we're picking up on here. Or let's say if somebody comes back with low numbers for all of these, that could mean that they have a low production or it could mean that they are absorbing what is produced really, really efficiently. You can't tell the difference, can you? Similarly, somebody could have high levels or really nice looking levels of these short chain fatty acids but in actuality, that's showing up because they're losing short chain fatty acids via the stool and they're not absorbing efficiently. So that being said, that has been studied a fair whack and that does appear to play a role in what shows up in stool. And for that reason, I just don't find it super useful to actually measure short chain fatty acids because it's kind of a crapshoot, pun intended, as to the clinical relevance of it. You could just be absorbing more or less than we would otherwise expect, and it has not as much to do with your overall production. So take that with a very big grain of salt. It is, you know, possibly, possibly useful, but we really have no way of telling. And then finally, obviously, you know, red blood cells, they're looking for blood here, occult blood, pH. I'm glad that they measure pH because not a lot of the other labs do that. And then the color and consistency is pretty self-explanatory. And then finally, this is this is actually the big selling point. So like when when doctor's data goes to you know a conference and they they have the opportunity to pitch themselves to doctors, this is very frequently what gets talked about is that once you identify a microbe. So for example, for this person, Klebsiella, once you identify a microbe, you can then know for sure what you need to use against that microbe. So for example, this particular bacteria looks like it's more sensitive to grapefruit seed extract, but if you were to use berberine, it would have little to no value for this patient. And I don't think I question their ability to do this. I think that they probably are fine at like putting Klebsiella on a Petri dish and then testing against you know the inhibitory ability of these compounds and then documenting that. My big problem is, like I said, the this all hinges on the assumption that the information on the first page is clinically relevant and that this is the reason you have your symptoms. So in this case, we would assume that this person has their symptoms, let's say IBS and bloating. The assumption is that the, the bad bug, the Klebsiella, is causing your bloating, and therefore we need to kill it. And that is why they do the follow-up testing, and they do the culture with these compounds. Whoop, wrong page. They do the culture with the compounds, and then they tell you, ooh, you should use this and this, and then you'll kill it. And again, I, I really think that the first page of this test is hot garbage and has no clinical utility whatsoever. So, you know, that means that this is also useless. And I will tell you this, to confess internet, I ran this test for a, a while. I think it was about a year or so of my clinical career. I was running this exact doctor's data stool test, comprehensive stool test with parasitology times three. And I was sold at a conference. I was pitched that this was the best stool test, largely because they have that, that um, susceptibility thing at the very end. 
and therefore it takes the guesswork out of your clinical practice and you know what you need to do and then you just follow the directions on that. And I will tell you, I got spectacularly humdrum results. And that's why I stopped using it. Because if a test is going to A, cost my patient a couple hundred bucks and then not actually provide clinical utility and actionable insight, and it's not gonna to lead to appropriate decision-making on the part of the clinician, why on earth would I order that test? It, it just, it didn't add up. So I probably ordered this test for about a year when I first started practice. And after about that amount of time, I gave it a good go and I decided there must be something better than this. And then for a short time, I moved on to Genova. And similarly, I had some issues with their stool testing and then I eventually moved to the GI map which, you know, I've also recorded a video for that. I no longer recommend now in 2020, but for the time it was one of the better ones available and I used that and got some pretty good results. Um, I think that the doctor's data test and Genova, they do this too, when they're giving you these culture reports with the sensitivity to the different compounds, I think really they're just trying to take the, the guessing work out of it for the clinician because they acknowledge that clinicians are burned out, we're fatigued, we're overworked, we don't necessarily want to go on PubMed every time we have a stool test and say, okay, Klebsiella pneumoniae, what is it sensitive to? How can I break up the biofilm? How can I do the whatever? So it makes logical sense why they would just smear some of that on a Petri dish and then see what, it, what actually kills it or inhibits it. The problem is it doesn't really work. And I, again, I say this from firsthand experience. So I wish that I could go back in time and I could do a better stool test for those patients. Although honestly, I don't know if anything better was available at the time. Now, thankfully, we have the better technology. I feel like we're like a movie, like we have the technology. Uh, but we have DNA-based technologies where we could test either PCR or 16S stool testing, or even there's some whole genome metagenomics coming out. We have the technology to do better now. So we need to move on from this antiquated rubbish test that is the doctor's data stool test. So as frustrating as this is, if you have a doctor's data stool test, I, I mean, throw it away. I hate to say it, I think you wasted a couple hundred bucks and I, I would see if you could get a different test. If you're really wanting to assess your microbiome, I think there are better tests out there. You could certainly talk to the provider who ordered the doctor's data stool test for you. My hesitancy is that that person is probably not going to be equipped to help you interpret a different stool test, because if they've only ever used doctor's data, they probably are not familiar with the other test and they're not gonna help you make sense of it. If you do decide to do that though, or if you have another stool test, you can reach out to me and I offer like a functional medicine second opinion, where basically I will go over your stool test results or a functional medicine lab. I will make notes, write up a report or talk to you or both and then I can tell you my clinical interpretation of that and what I think you need to do nutritionally, lifestyle wise, you know, herbally in order to make symptomatic improvement based on that. I will share with you, if you send me a doctor's data stool test, I'm probably going to politely tell you that I think you wasted your money and there's probably not much clinical insight I can offer you from this particular test. But if you decide to do a different type of testing, a better type that is DNA based, then I would be happy to offer my clinical insight. And I just bill that at my hourly rate. So it just depends. If you have a lot of testing that you want to send to me, it's going to cost a little bit more. If it's just a one and done, it's probably not going to be that much. But I would be happy to engage with you via email and find out if that is something you would like to pursue. I will leave a link in the doobly-doo down below. So if you would like to pursue that, you can. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. I hope you have a wonderful day. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.